All right. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to uh, Grand Rounds Live. This is the first time for me doing this, so it's kind of exciting on all fronts. Uh, and we're going to be talking, Alan Gabriel and I are going to be the faculty, and we'll take a, first a superficial dive into prepectoral reconstruction, and then we'll both take this center stage and we'll be able to field a lot of questions and take a real deep dive into prepectoral reconstruction, because this is kind of a very cool procedure, gaining a lot of traction, creating a lot of excitement, a lot of buzz. Uh, this is just um, kind of a notification of what we're doing and just a little bit of a supplemental uh, guide. So Alan and I will kind of go over this in uh, a lot of detail over the next hour. So the whole concept of prepectoral is really not novel. It's kind of a newer approach to what was actually done about 40 years ago. Back then we were doing a lot of radical mastectomies and implants were placed in the subcutaneous plane. Obviously there was no pectoralis major, but they were subcutaneous. We didn't have the tools back then to make this work predictably. Now we've got the tools so we can do this in the immediate setting, we can do this in the delayed setting, and we can do it for secondary surgery as well, for revision procedures and, and uh, animation deformities especially. So there's a, lot of, there's a lot of perks about this. Now the advantages of prepectoral reconstruction are numerous. And when you really start to look at patients who have had implants placed under the pectoralis major muscle, you'll realize that there are some shortcomings, and they are really prevalent. Uh, we tended to kind of brush them under the rug because we didn't have a good treatment for uh, animation deformities. But some of the things listed here is the breast is reconstructed in its normal anatomic position. Normally when you go under the muscle, what are our barriers? That medial origin of the pectoralis major muscle. The breast doesn't conform to where that medial origin is. It's actually a little bit more sternal to that. So we can put an implant where an implant is really supposed to go. There's no animation, obviously, because we're not manipulating that muscle. We're not getting foreshortening of the muscle, and we're not getting movement because of the muscle. There's a potential for less pain because there's no spasm anymore. Yes, you'll have incisional pain, and it's not like these patients are going to be pain-free. But if you adopt some of these ERAS protocols, you can really reduce the pain, and patients can go home the same day. And if you do things kind of uh, while the mastectomy is going on, you can do some of this back table work and preparation. And this procedure can be very simple, quick, and efficient. The downside is that it's in a subcutaneous plane. You don't have a muscle buffer, so the implant may be more visible. So we have to rely on things like fat grafting, uh, so there is going to be a potential for rippling and wrinkling with some of these prepectoral approaches. Let's talk about some of the recent PRS manuscripts that have uh, just recently come out. So the first one was by Steve Siegelov. Steve is one of the pioneers with this. Right now he's probably done more prepectoral in the U.S. than I think anybody. He's probably up to about four or five hundred cases. But this was something that they published, and uh, Pat Maxwell is one of the co-authors, and uh, Noemi Sigalov, uh, and we'll kind of get into some of the details here. But at this point, they had done 353 reconstructions. The majority of these were bilateral, which is kind of reflective of what's going on in the country today. But if you look at the overall complication rates related to infection, seroma, and flap necrosis, they were pretty low, less than 5%. So patient selection is going to be important, and knowing who is a good candidate for prepectoral is also going to be important. So if somebody's got real thin skin flaps, you might not want to do prepectoral. The other good thing is they didn't really see capsular contracture, which kind of leads me to this point of like redefining what we call capsular contracture, because most of this implant tightening and elevation was really more of a muscle effect rather than a true capsule effect. Uh, here's just an example of one of Steve's patients. The top view is the preoperative, and the bottom view is the postoperative. Another patient, or another paper that just came out in September was by Hani Spatani at uh, University of California, San Francisco. And basically what he did was he compared his dual plane reconstructions to his prepectoral reconstructions. And he also had a number of patients. He had 51 patients, 84 breasts in the prepectoral cohort, and 115 patients, 186 breasts in the dual plane cohort. The nice thing about this paper is he demonstrated that there wasn't any significant difference when it came to adverse effects like infection, seroma, or explantation. None of these were statistically different, demonstrating equivalence in terms of complication rates, but the benefits are on the aesthetic side. So again, requirements, well vascularized flaps. That's going to be the common denominator in all of these prepectoral cases. 
here's an example of one of these patients that Hani published. Very thin, low BMI, uh, nipple sparing mastectomy, minimally inflated tissue expander. He did this in two stages, obviously. But postoperatively, the patient has very nice contour, well healed, didn't have nipple necrosis, and maintained kind of a natural sternal cleavage plane. Clearly an improvement in outcome. So I want to just take a minute to kind of put a plug in for the supplement that's coming out. The supplement will be released in November or December. It's got seven articles written by people who do a lot of prepectoral reconstruction covering the full spectrum from preoperative, challenging cases, one stage, two stage, outcomes, economics, all of these things will be highlighted. So these are again just some of the, uh, myself, Pat Maxwell, and Scott Glassberg are the editors of the supplement, and these are the authors that we've had contribute to the supplement. When you do, with classic dual plane reconstruction and radiation, you get that classic elevation of the inframammary fold. Really it's because of the muscle activity pulling it out pulling it up. But with radiation and prepectoral, that inframammary fold doesn't change. You can still get tightening, you can still get chin skin changes, but you don't get that same degree of upper pole distortion. Anyway, just keep in mind, prepectoral, I think, is going to be a paradigm shift in the way we do reconstruction. I mean, we have no animation, we have less pain, we got ideal device location, and patients love this. When, once they find out about prepectoral reconstruction, it's kind of a patient-driven phenomenon. So keep that in mind. Your patients are going to love this operation because they're not going to have that tightness. So I think what we'll do at this point is, Alan, if you can come up to the stage, you and I can sit down and we can answer some questions. And I think our resident ambassadors are going to try to grill us here and make the attendings look bad. So let's see. Bring it on, guys. Well, thank you, uh, Dr. Nahabidi and, and Dr. Gabriel, for being here, uh, and thank you all for attending today. Um, so I'm just going to start off the Q&A. So clearly this is um, you know, very patient-selective. You have to pick the right patient to do this in. Um, in your experience, obviously, is vast. What are your uh, indications for when you can safely do this, and when uh, do you say, well, maybe we can't do this safely? Well, that's a great question. That's probably the most common question asked is when can we do prepectoral reconstruction safely? One of the important things that uh, Mo already mentioned is we need a well vascularized flap. Uh, if we don't have a good uh, fa uh, flap to start with, we're already set up for failure. So a well vascularized flap, non-smokers, controlled diabetes with A1C less than 7.5, and a favorable tumor, and those are specifically uh, important when you're talking about the on uh, oncological indications for these patients, especially if it's a deep chest wall tumor, we got to be able to be cognizant of those and uh, make sure you bring it up at a multidisciplinary uh, conference and make sure everyone's comfortable with the decisions that you're making. But generally speaking, deep chest wall tumors, we don't do prepectoral reconstruction. Yeah, and I think when you're first, you know, embarking on prepectoral reconstruction, really try to pick that ideal patient, maybe a, a younger patient, middle age tight skin, not real totic, um, maybe not morbidly obese, but as you get more comfortable with this operation, you'll find that your indications will expand because you will have acquired a skill set where you can make things work. Uh, but some of the hard contraindications like the you know, poorly controlled diabetes, tobacco use, just don't do prepectoral on patients like that. Thank you. Um, how are you covering these implants? What are you using? Um, and is it full wrap, anterior? Wrap technique. So everybody's different on this aspect. I personally do a 180 degree wrap, but I do like an inferior cuff. I create a little bit of a gutter so that the implant can sit in that gutter, and I think it gives us better lower pulse support. Um, so for me, the 180 degree wrap works best. Um, Alan, what, do you, what about you? What do you prefer? I know that's a great question. If you poll different surgeons, everyone's going to have a different answer. Over the years of doing it, one thing I would say with uh, Steve Jacobson, Steve Sigalov, and Pat Maxwell, uh, when we started it, it originally was a different idea of uh, trying to cover 180. But now when you talk to uh, Steve Sigalov specifically, uh, he's been doing a complete coverage. Now, you may ask yourself, is that important to do a complete coverage? Well, uh, what I can tell you is when you have a complete coverage, you're kind of dictating where that implant is going to sit and where that 
new capsule, rather new ADM, it's going to dictate where it's going to be your new footprint of your breast is going to sit. That's not going to change as we see in dual plane reconstructions, you can get lateral malpositions. With prepectoral reconstruction with a complete coverage, as Mo stated, the cuff, both imperially and laterally, uh, if you're doing 180 or if you're doing a full wrap, then you don't need to worry about a cuff. You are dictating where that footprint is going to be, and it's going to remain there, and your malpositions are going to be really non-existent. I, don't I have not seen a malposition with a prepectoral reconstruction. And that was one of my concerns when I first started doing this, is are we going to get like a rock and a sock phenomenon? But that hasn't happened, because you don't have the muscle forces displacing this implant anymore. The other thing about 180 versus 300 is you really have to kind of think about the economics, because oftentimes people are using an acellular dermal matrix. These are expensive materials. And in my hands, I could probably reduce the cost or keep it more contained with a 180 degree wrap rather than a full wrap because you have to use more ADM. And I'm playing the devil's advocate to the full wrap. Uh, I started with the an anterior wrap only and I've converted. Or, uh, and when you look at uh, how the breast looks and behaves, it's definitely differently. And when we're looking at overall, while we bring up cost, economic cost, when we're looking at it, we, just like any product, any new technique that we start, we need to really evaluate the, in, the, in the context of the long-term outcomes uh, how, what the overall value of that particular product or technique is rather than immediate cost. Because as we probably will get into, there's tremendous amount of benefit in prepectoral reconstruction that there's tremendous amount of economic benefits that we're seeing. So uh, just keep that in mind. The overall cost may be high, but important to keep in mind what the long-term outcomes are. And there's more and more evidence now coming out. I mean, there's no substitute for patient satisfaction, so there's no way I'm going to go back to what I was doing because the new strategies, these new techniques are far superior, and at the end of the day, patient satisfaction is going to dominate what we do. And this is a patient-driven phenomenon, and you know, we're, we're riding the wave, basically. So let's talk a little bit about fat grafting in these patients. So my understanding is basically 100% of these patients are getting fat grafting. What's your timing for that? Where's the fat going? And have you had any problems uh, because you've obviously got a slightly smaller flap to put your fat into? So, uh, I don't know about 100% to be honest with you. Uh, uh, I would say probably 50 to 60% of my patients are getting fat grafted. Just because we're doing prepectoral reconstruction does not mean every patient has to be fat grafted because we are tackling uh, higher BMI patients. Those are not the first patients to start with, but those generally do not need to be fat grafted. Having also said that, uh, when you're using more cohesive uh, fifth generation implants, whether anatomically shaped or round shaped, you're actually not, may not necessarily need to fat graft them. Will you have rippling or will you fill the implant with a prepectoral reconstruction and a dual plane? Absolutely, you're going to have it with both. We all know our dual plane cases, we've gone back five, six, seven years later and you see how thin that muscle is. So really what kind of support or what kind of value is that muscle really adding to our thickness? But I would say for fat grafting, for me, it's anywhere from about 50 to 60 percent. And for me, it's a little bit less. I'd say I definitely fat graft about a third of my patients, but again, it's part of that patient selection criteria. So I'm offering prepectoral reconstruction to patients who've got reasonably healthy and flaps that have a good subcutaneous layer. And because I'm using those highly cohesive gel implants that tend to ripple less, I think it's really minimized the amount of fat grafting that I have to do. Yeah, and I agree with you, Mo, and I think one of the important things is that I don't want anyone walking away saying we're not get, we don't have rippling. We do have rippling, but then the question comes over, uh, uh, when you think about it, patients, when I ask them, would you rather have an animation deformity that you're uncomfortable or would you rather deal with rippling? And those are the questions we should be asking our patients. The best patient is when an existing augmentation patient shows up for, a immediate, for candidacy of immediate reconstruction. You have them flex, and if that bothers them, if they have animation issues already with an existing augmentation, you ask them, are you comfortable with this? If you're not, we're going to go over the muscle. However, you may have more rippling, and patients generally will pick the more rippling than having pain and discomfort or animation issues. Rippling's not usually as embarrassing because a lot of women, it's when they tighten up or they bend over and all of a sudden the muscle contracts and you get that upper pole distortion. That can be very embarrassing for a lot of women. Rippling, you can easily camouflage. Uh, it's, it's a totally different thing. They would definitely take rippling over the animation.
Oh, absolutely. I, I agree with that. I, I think with, uh, and that's, uh, there's patients with, and ask your own patients have had dual plane reconstruction. The majority of them will say they are very uncomfortable wearing a low cut shirt or when they're in a bathing suit top, generally they're afraid at the beach or uh, be involved in some sort of activity because they see the animation rippling they can deal with. So we're going to open it up for questions from the audience. So if anybody in the audience has any questions, uh, either raise your hand and we'll bring you a mic or step up to the mic here. Hi, uh, Erez Diane from the Harvard Plastic Surgery Program. As this becomes more popular in the immediate setting, um, I've noticed some surgeons have taken sort of extreme measures in terms of dealing with breast surgeons, in terms of um, delaying the, the flap so that they have a good mastectomy flap to work with. Some people are using endocyanin green on these cases routinely. How do you uh, kind of assure that in these patients who really want prepectoral implants, you have a uh, you know healthy mastectomy flap to work with? So uh, that's a great question. I, I think as we move forward, we're also seeing uh, our breast surgeons being more sophisticated. I think the younger generation of breast surgeons are definitely sophisticated and more open to ideas and give delivering better outcomes for our patients, delivering better flaps. We are seeing that and hopefully we'll continue to see that in the future because that's the only way we as plastic surgeons can succeed with these types of reconstructions. In terms of angiography goes, I do uh, ICG angiography on all my patients, whether uh, photo view from InBeauty or Hamamatsu, uh, the PDE from Hamamatsu, I use both of those. They're inexpensive as compared to the SPI technology. Um, the important thing here is that as we are uh, evaluating our flaps, if we're concerned at all, there's nothing wrong with walking away from the reconstruction and coming back two weeks later and performing it, so doing an immediate delay. Let's say you're not ready for that. You can still delay the reconstruction and come back and do a prepectoral reconstruction. Those are some of the easiest ways to start. The one caveat to that is if it is a central incision and the general surgeons did close a central incision uh, following a skin sparing, just make sure you may want to fat graft that prior to your prepectoral reconstructions. So your first stage in that case will be fat grafting. Second stage will be your expander placement. Because keep in mind, when you're in a prepectoral pocket in a delayed reconstruction, you're going to be entering in the subcutaneous pocket through an inframammary fold incision, which is my general approach. But I learned that from Pat Maxwell. Uh, and then you will release a central scar. The last thing you want to do is have dermis attached to the pec as you're going into that plane and uh, buttonholing the central scar. So. Typically what I do now, when I see patients in the office for the first time and we're talking about prepectoral reconstruction, I'll tell them what I do is really going to be a game time decision. If the skin flaps are healthy and well perfused, we'll do prepectoral. Now I tell them if the skin flaps are not healthy, poorly perfused, and I have questions about viability, we're just going to put the skin back down on the chest wall and come back in two weeks. So you, you kind of set that expectation because I think that's important to do. What I was doing before is that I would say, well, if it's not healthy, then I'll go ahead and do a dual plane. I'll go under the muscle. And then what was happening, the patients would come back to the office and they were upset that we had to go dual plane because all of a sudden they had the tightness and they had the animation. So I've really got to the point now where I am rarely doing any sort of subpectoral device placement in the setting of prosthetic reconstruction because I think the way to go is prepectoral on all these patients. I'm literally convinced that in the reconstruction patients, implants should not go under the pectoral muscle. It's just the way it is. No, I have a question, Mo. So what, what if, and it, because these are some of the questions that have come up in the past, is what if the patient already has a dual plane vest, so the surgeon felt comfortable, didn't feel comfortable doing prepectoral, and moved forward with a dual plane reconstruction? We can still convert that to a prepectoral during the second stage. That's a, that's a very, very straightforward operation, um, and it... It, you can still go prepectoral if you did dual plane. So it, the psychological aspect of it is, well, what if the patient doesn't want to wake up without a breast? And we hear that, we, we've seen evidence, uh, but I'm like, Mo, if I have to avoid it, I'd rather not do dual plane, but surgeons do prefer to do a dual plane. I think we can, yeah, I have done it, we can go over during the second stage. Thanks, I'm Ramon, I'm Erez's co-chief at Harvard. and. One other question. For those BRCA positive patients who are coming in for prophylactic mastectomies and they're particularly large and tonic and they're thinking of a staged oncoplastic procedure, either like a superior pedicle um, wise, 
Are you comfortable? Um, how long are you comfortable one putting it pre-pack thereafter, um, having now done the the lift, and and if so, how long is your stage between the two so that you know the nipple will be viable? So in a BRCA positive patient where you're not dealing with cancer, yeah, you could go ahead and do a pre-mastectomy reduction mastopexy type procedure, and Scott Spear wrote this up a few years ago, and the results are very predictable, and nipple perfusion and viability will be maintained. Fortunately, it's kind of um, going to be a prophylactic mastectomy, so when you do go back, you don't have to super skeletonize those skin flaps, and nipple viability is going to be maintained. In the prophylactic patient, I would typically wait about three months. So I would let everything heal. I would go back in through the inframammary approach, especially if you've had an inverted T-type pattern. You can go through that inferior approach and then do the mastectomy, do your prepectoral reconstruction, and, and you'll be fine. Um, so that's what I would typically recommend in somebody who needs you know, nipple repositioning prior to mastectomy. And Scott Spear wrote on that was three months. I, that's what I use too, and I think that's what generally everyone is using correctly. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a safe procedure, and I think it's safe, predictable, and reproducible. Um, so you, got, you were talking a little bit about uh, onco uh, oncologic considerations and doing prepec, especially deep chest wall tumors or ones that may be uh, abutting or invading the pectoralis. Um, can you elaborate a little bit more on oncologic considerations for prepectoral and how you integrate uh, anticipated need for uh, adjuvant therapy into your decision making? I think Mo and I have the same answers when it comes uh, to, uh, uh, to that sp specific subject. But well, one thing I, I want to say is oncological uh, contraindications do exist and we have to be smart. Maybe those contraindications will change over the next five to ten years, but just like anything else, when you look at nipple sparing mastectomies, we, we were very, very conservative when we started and that's what we want to be doing. Uh, now you can see nipple sparings you're doing on more advanced breast cancer patients. Same thing with prepectoral. We're starting conservative, we'll be more aggressive. One of the things that we all agree on, deep chest wall tumors that cannot be monitored deep to, uh, near the pectoralis, even though you're taking the pectoralis fascia, those are the ones we avoid prepectoral reconstruction. You can make an argument for also grossly uh, positive axilla that uh, pretty much during clinical exam, you can, you can fill the lymph nodes. Those are also questionable for prepectoral reconstruction. If there is any concern at all, take it to uh, have tumor uh, during tumor board, bring it up, have a consensus, uh, multidisciplinary consensus, and then move forward. If it's a straightforward, it's great, but if there's questionable one, you want to have your breast surgeon support, oncology support, and radiation oncology support. And when it comes to radiation, as Mo already stated, I mean, he beautifully showed what happens. In, in the beginning, one I would say, if the patient is going to radi be radiated, we're going to put it under the muscle, but that is not the case. If the patient is going to be radiated, we are going over the muscle. And for the reasons that Mo already stated, I'll let him elaborate on that. And I've actually looked at my early experience, and this will all come out in the supplement, and I've stratified these patients who have had dual plane and who have had prepectoral, and I've looked at it in this context of whether they had chemotherapy and whether they had radiation therapy. And the good thing is, the radiation patients will have complications in accordance to the radiation. Yes, so complications may go up, but it's not because it was prepectoral. It's because of the fact that there was radiation. Chemotherapy doesn't seem to influence those complication rates, but the benefits of having a prepectoral device radiated are by far outweigh those potential risks for complications because you don't get that distortion, you don't get that discomfort. And once you've got radiated pectoral muscle that's been elevated, it's very hard to work with that and manipulate it. So the good thing is adjuvant treatments don't seem to be at all a contraindication to prepectoral reconstruction. And just to elaborate on that, uh, Mo already uh, specifically stated with the pocket, we have a control, we are able to control that following radiation with uh, ADM and the prepectoral space because the muscle fibrosis that occurs after radiation is significant that none of us ever appreciated over time. All you have to do is look at your mastectomy scar or elevates. It's not the contracture that's occurring. It's really the muscle that's fibrosing over time. The one thing we don't have the best answer for, as Mo already stated, is we have the, with the capsule, one layer we have figured out. The soft tissue, we haven't really figured out how we can improve that over time. Fat grafting is an option. We know that will help. Oh, well, but that's gonna take two, three years for us of multiple fat grafting, so hopefully improve that skin. So when you're really thinking about it, we have two layers we're working with, so we have the 
pocket, the periprosthetic pocket, whether it's ADM or whatever it may be, and then the soft tissue. But you know, it brings me up to the point, you know, the, the concept of this bioengineered breast that Pat Maxwell and Alan Gabriel wrote about a couple of years ago is really critical to what we're doing today. That because it's the, these ADMs, these better implants, the ability to put fat, you know, we can reverse some of those changes associated with radiation. We can minimize some of the rippling that we would typically see. We don't get the capsular contracture that we used to see. You know, all of these concepts that go into the bioengineered breast are what's made this operation possible today. And we're seeing more and more uh, European studies now. I mean, uh, one of them uh, uh, was published by Bernini, and it showed that I mean, they have they also have zero capsule contracture rates in, with 25 month follow up. And that particular study also looked at, as uh, more already alluded to, the aesthetic appearance of the breast uh, using breastcue, and the patients were more satisfied with pre pectoral reconstruction. So. It, it is exciting what we're seeing, and it's, uh, Europe is also validating it, and our colleagues are validating it, so it, it is an exciting time in breast surgery. Uh, sorry if you've already touched on this. Uh, I was too busy tweeting what a great job you've done for this, so thank you. Um, gentlemen, um, what's your opinion of uh, fat grafting at the immediate reconstruction setting? with prepectoral breast augmentation. Is that something you've done? What do you think about it? Would you do it? Pros, cons? Uh, there are some people pushing that. So what are your opinions on that? So I know that this is something that's been discussed and talked about. My personal preference is to fat graft at the second stage rather than immediate. Oftentimes the skin flaps are a little bit too thin for me to safely and predictably place fat into a layer where it's not going to kind of fall out of that space and then you're going to have loose fat kind of around the device and it may be an inflammatory mediator that may end up causing some future problems or short-term problems. So my personal preference is to wait until that second stage or third stage to do the fat grafting. I don't know if you feel differently about that, Alan, but... No, I, I agree 100%. The first stage is, there's, the surgery is complex enough and worrisome enough. I mean, we, we lose sleep over it. Uh, it the flaps are going to do well. Now we're adding another level of complexity to an existing, maybe good vascularized flap, but again, you're adding fat that has to remain within that mastectomy flap. Now, given that, if it's a low BMI patient, that's not going to be very thick for us to start with. So where are we going to put it? And now all of a sudden we're introducing another factor that can lead to seroma infection. That's the last thing I want to do with my prepectoral immediate reconstructions. I have two questions. Uh, so I agree, control of the pocket is a lot greater here. So what are your cutoffs uh, in regard to ptosis for who you will do this on before you might go to a Weiss pattern? And then what percentage do you do uh, direct to implant prepectoral versus expanders? Personally, I, I like to offer this, patients, this to patients who have grade one or grade two ptosis. The grade three ptosis, I think you need to do something preoperatively because I think at the end of the day, that skin envelope isn't really going to change. I mean, you may make a vertically based incision below the areola and get some nipple elevation, but at the end of the day, you're still going to probably have some degree of ptosis, and it's going to be harder to correct that ptosis after you've done the mastectomy and you've got your prepectoral device. Then to lift that nipple, it's going to be a little bit more challenging. Um, I don't know, Alan, is that, uh, has no. that been... Yeah, no, I agree with you 100%. Uh, generally, the uh, rule I try to go by nipple inframammary fold distance on stretch of about 11 to 12 centimeters. That's the max yeah. I've been able to save. And we do very, uh, I mean, I have no problem of doing a vertical and then if I need to horizontal incision with a deepithelialized flap underneath it to right. protect my incision or my T-junction yeah. on those larger patients, uh, larger breasted patients. Sure. Actually, the larger breasted patients are sometimes, believe it or not, uh, easier to do because you have so much the epithelialized flap that you're able to cover it, you do so much soft pocket work to stabilize that pocket. And I think that's where, as we're talking about with the malposition, the gutter, as Mo stated, inferiorly, very important laterally to minimize the malpos uh, malpositions laterally as well, or if you do a full, uh, full coverage anteriorly and posteriorly, that will be uh, another way to avoid it. Yeah, and certainly if patients are choosing to have skin sparing mastectomy, then, then the equation is so much simplified. Um, your other question was whether it's direct to implant versus two-stage. Probably 85% of what I do is two-stage, uh, and there are a number of reasons for that. I typically like that second stage to really fine-tune and really give me precise implant 
characteristics so I can really get that result that we're trying to achieve. But there are a number of plastic surgeons that are doing direct to implant, getting beautiful results, but that's really going to be highly dependent on your breast surgeon. You 100% have to have a breast surgeon that's going to leave you thick, robust, viable skin flaps. It, otherwise, I, I tend to do two-stage. Uh, I agree. Steve Sigalov does 40 to 50 percent direct to implant Jacobs and probably another 30 to 40 percent. So, I mean, they're doing, they get excellent results, uh, but we're very dependent on our uh, breast surgeons. Aris Levin, NYU. Thank you very much for a great lecture. Um, what are some of your uh, algorithms to approaching ischemic complications like full fitness, nipple and mastectomy, flap necrosis over just ADM and an implant? You know, this is, this is a sensitive subject because one thing about prepectoral is you have very little wiggle room. And if you see a problem brewing, you have to act early. You know, you don't have that muscle barrier to protect you in the setting of, you know, full thickness, full thickness skin loss. So when I see something starting to go south, I'm aggressive. I'm moisturizing the skin. I'm starting them on antibiotics. If I see any signs of necrosis or delayed incisional healing, I'm either revising that in the office or I'm taking them back to the operating room because there's very little wiggle room it, and things can deteriorate quickly. So in my review, I mean, I probably had a 6% explantation rate uh, based on healing issues. Um, so that's just something that you have to accept and you have to let patients know about this. Uh, but that's why working with a breast surgeon and having that relationship and the confidence in the skin flaps is critical. I agree 100%. Uh, one of the early things we learned very quickly based on complications in prepectoral reconstruction was you have no wiggle room. You see it's demarcated, you go back. Second point to make is let's say you got this patient through it and somehow it healed. Guess what? During the second stage, you're going to see non-incorporation right under that flap because early on what happens is any ADM is going to be inhibition, just like a skin graft. If you do not have that opposition, what's going to happen is uh, it's going to just... Uh, be loose, you're going to be dealing with loose, non-incorporated ADM, so you have to be prepared for that. So either way, you're going to have an issue. Either you want to take care of it right away, or you want to take care of it at the second stage. Uh, David Kelly from Phoenix, Arizona. Um, as you both mentioned, as the literature shows, um, prepec has been holding up uh, better with radiation. So has this changed your algorithm for free flap reconstruction? It's a good question. So typically, Patients with dual plane prosthetic devices that had been previously radiated will do well in the short run. And you know, you follow these patients out several years and they start to deteriorate over time. You get displacement, you get tightness, you get discomfort, and they end up having flap reconstruction. Because the muscle is no longer in that superior plane causing the degree of distortion and change, who knows? I mean, maybe we've got these prepectoral devices that have been radiated and by fat grafting, we can maybe minimize or obviate the need to do free flap reconstruction in the long run as well. We haven't been doing it long enough. You know, I've got two and a half year follow up on some of these patients, but at two and a half year follow up, I'm optimistic. So time will tell. I just don't have the answer yet as to how it'll affect our free tissue transfer or pedicle flap reconstruction after radiation. I agree with you. Uh, I, we just. Uh, we just have to wait and see long-term follow-ups, and that's what we're always encouraging people that are doing it. Please report because we need more data, uh, so we can justify what we're doing. And and I think it's just going to take time for us to see that. But early, we up to three, three and a half years, we have not seen any major issues. If we do have issues such as from radiation, if they've been boosted or something happens, yes, for a salvage operation, latissimus, but with still an implant in place, but not complete free tissue transfer. As a uh one last wrap-up question. What, what's next with this, with prepectoral reconstruction and, or more broadly with implant-based reconstruction? What's on the horizon? What should we be working towards? Well, um, well, I wish Pat Maxwell was here because, as you know, he always sees, looks into the future. He'll start doing things way before any of us and teaches us. But one of the things that I think if he was here he would share is the future is exciting. Why? Because one of the things that we're waiting to see is a future needs to be an FDA approval of a device and a tissue together. So basically, you go in on the shelf, you say, I'm going to need a 13 centimeter whatever expander. The tissue comes with it. It's pre-shaped. You put it on the device, put it in, you walk away. So that's basically the exciting part of our future, right? Will that happen five years, 10 years, 15 years? But if you were to ask that question 
uh, I think that's, that's our future. We need something that is simple. Attach, place, walk away. You know, I think you know, we're in an era now of regenerative medicine and regenerative technology, and I think our ability to kind of create things now and to make fat and to make cartilage and fashion and things like that is remarkable. And who knows, I mean, we may get into an era where we're using hybridized products, where we're using ADMs in conjunction with cellular elements and growth factors and stem cells that really is going to make breast tissue and subcutaneous fat. And then breast reconstruction really will be breast augmentation for a lot of these women who are having mastectomies. It's kind of remarkable. I think the future is really exciting. Well, on behalf of all of PRFs, thank you, Dr. Nahabidi, and thank you, Dr. Gabriel, for participating, and, and thank you for everyone for coming and joining us. Thank you.